When the American and British forces swept into Iraq, they were generally met with smiles and waves. And many more Iraqis cheered as statues of Saddam Hussein, one by one, came crashing down, thus ending the 25-year rule of a hated despot who had been driven underground by the advancing troops. But events did not turn out exactly as planned. There was chaos in the streets. Looters made off with anything of value, including medical supplies from hospitals and precious artifacts from museums. Then the American troops began to suffer losses at the hands of the people they had supposedly liberated. Saboteurs and suicide bombers attacked oil installations and buildings occupied by foreign powers, including the United Nations offices in Baghdad. And the Iraqi police, newly recruited by the occupying forces, were also targeted. Stung by this seeming lack of gratitude, the Americans at first dismissed these attacks as the work of a few die-hard loyalists. But when Saddam Hussein was eventually found and arrested, the attacks persisted and intensified. And as U.S. casualties began to mount, the military began an aggressive campaign to root out the insurgency. Thousands of suspects were rounded up, jailed, and routinely tortured. American troops attacked resistance strongholds with tanks and helicopters. The effort was often heavy-handed, resulting in many Iraqi civilian casualties, including the family of this farmer near Fallujah. This boy, when he grows up, he will hate Americans. Here, as a tradition, when a father is killed, or a brother, or a cousin, someone has to take his place. I want to ask this boy, who killed your father? Tell us, do not be afraid. Tell us, who killed your father? The Americans. Where was your father going this morning? To Fallujah. To do what? To bring some fuel and bread. Did he carry weapons of mass destruction? What shall we tell him? Your father is a good human or the Americans are the good human? But these raids did little to blunt the insurgency. Rather, they inflamed much of the local population against the occupation. The Americans are the cause of this mess. And if the situation remains the same, it is possible that all of us will start resisting the Americans. It's my belief that also Iraq is the richest country in the Middle East, because God Almighty, who created Adam, the Bible and the Quran, stated he created the wealth and the oil in Iraq. As you know, Iraq has the second oil reserve in the world. Iraq is a rich country, and this war is to complete the Israeli plan. The Americans are, do you think the Americans are concerned for the Iraqi people? Is the president who, is, who has power without the Americans approval? Who made the embargo on the Iraqis? The claim weapons of mass destruction is here. The Iraqi people are poor. They don't have weapons of mass destruction. America got Iraq in many wars. This problem will start with the Americans and it will end with their demise. The electricity here is zero. They claim they fixed the network. They are lying. They say they built our schools. This building will collapse in two to three years. If they are sincere, they will demolish them and rebuild them back. We hear reports that um, Sunni insurgents are fighting the U.S. military in Fallujah. And then we hear that Shiites are fighting the U.S. in Najaf. And then we hear um, Sunnis and Shiites are fighting U.S. forces in different parts of the country. What's lacking here is any mention that Sunnis and Shiites, in fact, make up 90% of Iraqis. And that whereas our military, our U.S. Journalists, our media should be telling us that in fact this is widespread Iraqi resistance to the U.S. occupation. They try to compartmentalize it for us and say this faction here and that faction there and this faction here don't like us. But they never give the American public the whole picture and they give the impression that these people are a minority and there's a whole bunch of other factions that really do want us there. Um, and that's something that I don't think that the U.S. public has really come to understand. When Iraq was invaded, it has been now one year and a few months under occupation. What does America want from Iraq? What kind of freedom is this? This occupation is destroying our infrastructure. 
They are burdening the country with debt, stealing our wealth. Israel controls the area. Why do they call us Muslim terrorists? We are a country who had freedom, dignity. We have 7,000 years of civilization. America's civilization is 300 years. We have qualified people to run this country. What is rehabilitation America is doing to us? Let's be frank, the nominating and voting will be illegitimate under occupation. In June of 2004, the handover of sovereignty to a UN-appointed Iraqi government marked the official end of the occupation. Nevertheless, over 150,000 coalition forces remained, and work continued on the construction of six permanent U.S. military bases. The land that is now known as Iraq was once the birthplace of modern civilization. In 3000 BC, the fertile area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers gave rise to a new form of society with cities, money, laws, and government. Many of the civilizations that followed expanded and conquered neighboring lands, claiming their territories and subjugating their people. By the year 2500 BC, this pattern of conquest became the dominant form of human civilization with the rise of the Sumerian Empire. Some empires were short-lived, others lasted centuries, some withered away by assimilation with the conquered people. All eventually succumbed to inner decay, hostile takeover, or resistance from the occupied people. Throughout history, resistance to occupation has taken many forms, sometimes violent, sometimes nonviolent. Whatever the method, resistance has been a major factor in destabilizing and ultimately toppling an imperial power. At the height of their powers, empires usually regarded themselves as benevolent civilizing forces, bringing order and prosperity to less advanced people, and, until the last century, took pride in the extent of their dominion. With the conquest of parts of Mexico in 1846 and the occupation of the Philippines in 1902, America was well on its way to forming an empire of its own. But in the 20th century, the term empire began to fall out of favor. Without claiming any further conquered territory, the United States gradually adopted a policy of economic and ideologic hegemony, backed by an increasingly powerful military. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, America further extended its global network of military bases and alliances, the legacy of World War II and the Cold War, to exploit its position of military dominance and to protect and expand its business interests in an increasingly global economy. Today there are about 700 U.S. military bases in more than 40 countries and alliances and military ties with over 60 more. In all, a military presence in at least 140 countries. In the 16th century, the three Mesopotamian provinces of Basra, Baghdad, and Mosul became part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire and remained so until World War I. When Turkey sided with Germany in 1914, the British drove back the Ottoman Empire and began to impose their own hegemony on the region. And in 1919, British emissary Gertrude Bell drew the boundaries of the new state of Iraq, wresting Mosul from Turkey and carving off oil-rich Kuwait from Basra. She also engineered the installation of King Faisal, brother of the King of Syria, as ruler of Iraq but in name only. All the important decisions were to be made in London. Behind this facade of monarchy, the British often had difficulty in maintaining control in Iraq and suffered heavy losses in revolts throughout the 1920s, including an uprising in Najaf, which claimed the lives of 2,000 imperial soldiers. This period also saw the first use of chemical weapons in the region when Royal Air Force planes bombed Kurdish villages in the 1922 Suleimania Rebellion. After the British mandate expired in 1929, King Faisal's son and successor, King Ghazi attempted to steer Iraq away from British hegemony until his death in 1933. During World War II until 1948, the British reoccupied Iraq, but nationalist movements continued and the monarchy ultimately fell to a military coup in 1958. Arab nationalism under the leadership of Egyptian President Abdul Nasser was at its peak, and in Syria the secular nationalist Ba'ath or Rebirth party arose. For the next five years, communist and Ba'athist factions within the Iraqi military vied for supremacy, and in 1963, a Ba'athist coup ushered in a regime that was to remain in power until 2003.
The Ba'ath Party leader, Saddam Hussein, had gradually gained control of the entire government by the systematic execution of his opponents, and in 1979 he appointed himself President of the Republic of Iraq. Meanwhile, in neighboring Iran, Islamic revolutionaries had toppled the pro-American government. In the turmoil following the revolution, Saddam Hussein launched a war against Iran, hoping that a quick victory would help shore up his regime and curry favor with the United States. But the war was a bloody stalemate until its conclusion in 1988. Throughout the 1980s, the U.S. and France quietly provided weapons and intelligence to Iraq and failed to object when Iraq used chemical weapons against the Iranians and their Kurdish allies. In 1991, the informal alliance between America and Iraq abruptly ended when Saddam Hussein's army invaded Kuwait. A coalition of forces led by the U.S. with the United Nations approval quickly drove the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. As the Iraqi army retreated, an uprising occurred in southern Iraq. The poorly armed Shiite rebels expected the Americans to come to their aid, but the U.S. troops did nothing while Saddam Hussein's security forces decimated the rebels with helicopter gunships and rounded up the remnants for execution. During the next 12 years, Iraq was subjected to harsh U.N.-imposed economic sanctions and intrusive weapons inspections. In addition, the northern and southern thirds of the country were patrolled by U.S. and British aircraft. The development of nuclear weapons, which was fairly advanced by 1991, was abandoned, and all the biological and chemical weapons stockpiles were destroyed either by the UN inspectors or secretly by the Iraqis. When a terrorist organization based in Afghanistan destroyed the World Trade Center in New York and damaged the Pentagon with hijacked airliners in September 2001, the United States declared a war on terror and within a month began bombing Afghanistan. Bolstered by an easy victory in Afghanistan, although many of the principal terrorists remained at large, the now popular Bush administration set its sights on Iraq, claiming that Saddam Hussein was a tyrant who had ties to terrorists and was concealing weapons of mass destruction that threatened the United States. Regime change in Iraq had become official U.S. policy. Regime change as a concept is not a lawful um, principle in international law. Under the United Nations Charter, no country has the right to change the regime, to forcibly change the regime of another. Also under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a treaty ratified by the United States protects the right of peoples to self-determination, as does the United Nations Charter. And therefore, the whole concept of regime change is an unlawful one. In the media, we see people in Iraq who are resisting the occupation referred to as the insurgents. And they're mushed together with the terrorists. I think it's very important to keep clear that there is a distinction between people such as Al-Qaeda forces and such as U.S. forces which target civilians, whether they do it with suicide bombs or whether they do it with cluster bombs and depleted uranium. When civilians are targeted, we're talking about terrorism. We're talking about terrorists. But when people in a country are resisting the occupation of their country, resisting it with armed force, that is a legitimate exercise of self-determination. That is called a national liberation struggle. Under the United Nations Charter, there are only two instances which would allow armed force, the use of armed force, against another country. One is if the country using armed force is acting in self-defense against an imminent threat against it or other UN member nations. The other instance where armed force is permissible is where the Security Council of the United Nations votes to authorize the use of armed force. Neither of those situations was present before Bush's invasion of Iraq. As I've said many times in the past, can one really imagine this war taking place if the principal export of Iran, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait were dates instead of petroleum? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and so while I think that there are lots of other issues, particularly uh, issues surrounding September 11th to do with you know, concerns, real or 
or not so real about weapons of mass destruction and possibly finding their way into the hands of terrorists. And real concerns that Saddam Hussein would never give up on his ambition to be a regional hegemon and that there can only be one regional he hegemon in the Persian Gulf and that, that is the United States. That even uh, so, the fundamental reason, the basic reason of American national interests behind this is to consolidate uh, American hegemony in the Persian Gulf uh, and that this is a region which is important only because of its oil resources. Uh, and I think that in, insofar as that is the basic uh, motivation, it actually corresponds to a, a government goal, a U.S. policy goal, that has been present since 1979, since the fall of the Shah, when the United States lost its client regime in Iran. And since 1979, I think uh, our country has been in the unenviable position of trying to uh, run uh, an American hegemonic system in the Persian Gulf from a big distance without having cooperative regime in either of the large uh, populated countries of the region, Iran and Iraq. And I think that almost everyone who served in government over the past uh, 20 years or 25 years or so has agreed that, that getting a, a compliant regime in one of those two capitals, Baghdad or Tehran, has been an urgent matter, but no government had ever felt that it was worth going to war for until September 11th. September 11th changed the equation, uh, however illogically, it changed the equation. And uh, I think that it's that combination of the long-standing uh, policy goal of consolidating control of the Persian Gulf by getting a pro-American regime in either Iran or Iraq connected with all of these powerful emotional and political uh, ideas and even emotions, you know, free-floating emotions that arise out of September 11th. I think the combination there is what led to the Iraq war. Oil prices have never been higher than during the current occupation of Iraq. Worldwide demand for petroleum has grown dramatically while exploration and production have not kept pace. Iraq has proven oil reserves of 112 billion barrels, but up to 90% of Iraq's potential oil resources remain unexplored. Conservative estimates put Iraq's total resources at 100 billion additional barrels. Despite production cost among the lowest in the world, only 2,000 oil wells have been drilled to date in Iraq, compared to about 1 million wells in Texas. In May 2003, the United Nations passed Resolution 1483 creating the Development Fund for Iraq with approximately $2 billion from the Embargo Era Oil for Food program and frozen Iraqi assets. All proceeds from Iraq's oil exports were to be added to this fund. The U.S. appointed Coalition Provisional Authority, CPA, was entrusted with the Development Fund to be used in a transparent manner to meet the humanitarian needs of the Iraqi people. Resolution 1483 also established the International Advisory and Monitoring Board, IAMB, to oversee the administration of the fund. But these measures have failed to safeguard against negligence and corruption. The IAMB reports that the Bush administration is withholding its audits of the 1.4 billion in contracts that it awarded to the Halliburton Corporation without competitive bidding. Vice President Cheney, former CEO of Halliburton, retains financial ties to this company. Bert Kupens, a representative to the IAMB from the International Monetary Fund, stated that, very early on, we have pointed towards the absence of oil metering. In other words, there was no control over how much oil is extracted and how much oil is sold and, consequently, deposited. In fact, since the occupation, no one knows how much oil has been pumped out of Iraq, who bought it, who sold it, or where the revenue went. To date, the people of Iraq have funded the American occupation with an estimated 2.5 billion of their own oil revenues, with American taxpayers providing 151 billion more. In an effort to win hearts and minds, American military personnel have distributed between 1 and 2 billion of Iraqi money to people in the street. The money is partly from frozen Iraqi assets and may also include some of the 8.8 .8 billion that has mysteriously vanished from the development fund of Iraq. Iraq's vulnerable oil pipelines have been the target of over 100 attacks since June of 2003. Saboteurs have struck at essentially every pipeline from Dahuk and Mosul in the north to Mina al-Bakar and Basra in the south. Iraqi resistance fighters have also assassinated several U.S.-appointed oil industry officials. During the 15-month existence of the Coalition Provisional Authority, its president, Paul Bremer, issued roughly 100 executive orders moving swiftly to end the national ownership of Iraq's mineral resources and to establish a privatized market economy in contravention of international law.
Edict 39, for example, provides for 100% ownership of Iraqi businesses by foreign interests, allowing these companies to take all of their profits out of Iraq. Moreover, these edicts are binding on any future Iraqi government, requiring the approval of the president, two vice presidents, and a majority of elected representatives for repeal or amendment. When we say that oil is the reason for this war, that statement really cannot be overstated. Oil is the reason for this war. If Iraq did not have oil, we would not be there. If Iraq did not have oil, we would not have supported Saddam Hussein for all the years that we did. And that really the fig leaf of weapons of mass destruction and the fig leaf of caring about Iraqi society and, and what Saddam Hussein was doing to Iraqis to me is so disturbing because it's so transparent. I mean that's clearly an excuse. It's cl clearly a made up reason. But it's disturbing because the majority of Americans believed it. I've recently heard Tony Blair and George Bush saying almost identical things about, about the war. Now that the fig leaf of weapons of mass destruction has been blown away, we need to revert to, but he was a brutal dictator, and no matter what you want to say about this war, the world is a better place because Saddam, is, Saddam Hussein is gone. But that very statement assumes so many things. It assumes that one nation can meddle in the affairs of another nation. I mean, many outside nations can look at us and say, those poor Americans, their president wasn't legitimately elected. We must go to their rescue. But that's so ludicrous. We as Americans should decide. We as Americans should say, the last election wasn't legitimate. We need to do something about it. We as Americans haven't made a decision to do that. No foreign power has the right to make that decision for us. And let's face it, there are brutal dictators all over the world, many of whom are our friends. If this was about toppling brutal dictatorships, why Iraq? Why now? And especially when this brutal dictator was our friend for so long. Saddam Hussein, no matter what, we cannot run away from the fact that he was a friend of the U.S. for decades. We knew that he had chemical weapons because many of his supplies came from U.S. companies. We knew he gassed the Kurds, and we went on having relations with him. When Iran went to the United Nations in the mid-1980s and sought a resolution condemning Iraq, condemning Saddam Hussein for using chemical weapons on Iranian troops in the battlefield, there was one country that blocked that from going through. There was one permanent member of the Security Council that stood up and said, there will not be a resolution condemning Iraq for the use of chemical weapons. And that one country was the United States. We went in there, and for many of these soldiers, with a contempt for Arabs, with a contempt for the people of Iraq. Although President Bush said a lot of niceties about liberating the people of Iraq, I don't think that the well-being of the people of Iraq was ever a factor in this war. Or, if it is, it's, it's been lost on me. The prison scandal really highlights that for me, because the treatment of those prisoners, irrespective of whether the orders came from up high or down low, or whether it was renegades or not, the treatment really for me evidences such a contempt, a racist contempt, for the people of this land, for the proud people of this land, that there is no way to cure that. There is no way to make the occupier see the occupied as human beings and really understand that they have pride above all, which Iraqis really carry the pr their pride on their sleeve. Um, there's no attempt to really win the hearts and minds of the people. In 1975, after more than a decade of fighting, an American attempt to impose a political solution on another country ended in failure. Today, after more than two years of military operations and reconstruction programs, most of Iraq remains under the control of the resistance.
The occupation has already cost the lives of over 1,000 American and coalition soldiers and scores of thousands of Iraqi military and civilians. The United States claims it is still fighting to bring democracy to Iraq, but it also intends to keep at least six permanent military bases there to maintain a large embassy and to retain its influence over Iraqi oil and business interests, thus perpetuating the occupation. Current Iraqi sentiment makes it likely that any democratically elected government would veto these goals of American hegemony. Removing Saddam Hussein was not the reason for war, and now the existing problems they cannot resolve. Of course, the opinion of the Iraqi people, honestly, that the Americans want a new situation here with an independent government building a new Iraq that the United States will be a friend to the Iraqis and to the Arabs. This is welcomed, but the occupation and the existing situation is unacceptable. On the other hand, it is possible that the United States might continue to rule Iraq much like the British did behind a facade of Iraqi sovereignty. Economic improvements could blunt the insurgency somewhat, but foreign military forces and contractors would most likely continue to be targeted by the nationalist guerrillas. Since neither of these options is desirable, the United States could cut its losses and simply withdraw. What can we do now? Uh, how can we just pull out? And my response is very easily to pull our forces out and to allow a military force which is led by the United Nations, not by the United States, to take over and help the Iraqis put back the pieces and bring stability to a country which has been tremendously destabilized by this illegal invasion. Any easy solution? Perhaps. It would certainly mean political suicide for an American leader that cuts and runs. And there are also fears that a civil war would break out once troops are withdrawn. And even a UN peacekeeping force would be unacceptable to many Iraqis. So the final outcome of the Iraq invasion remains uncertain. But one thing is clear. Freedom and occupation and democracy and empire just don't mix.